שלום אבריבדי, thank you for coming, welcome to the seventh international corporate governance conference of the Raymond Ackerman family chair. Um, this year is joined with the European Corporate Governance Institute. In our early conferences, we try to bring to Israel the best uh, up-to-date research and best scholars in this area so that we can contribute to local academics, community interested in corporate governance. And learn and uh, listen to you and learn everything you, you have to offer. Every year we, of course, focus on a different topic. This year, is a, it's about a differential voting shares. <coughs> and uh, we, we focus on it because we want to get in-depth uh, debates and uh, kind of discussions that will enrich everybody. We have good uh, experience with such conferences. And I encourage you to, to stay and talk and uh, somehow make it uh, worthwhile for all, everybody. OK. And uh, really, I wish everybody a pleasant and thought-provoking conference. Thank you. Uh, the logistics are like that. Um, you have to come to the podium, once I invite you, podium, talk to this mic so that we can record you and um, distribute the video through the ECGI channel. And uh, we have also a pointer, so we hope you can stay here. If not, you, you can pick the mic and go a little bit, move a little bit if you are too nervous. Okay. And uh, after I welcomed you, I want to invite our, uh, or maybe first um, have a presentation of the, those who sit uh, next to the table. So Jesse, you are the first to go. We'll go in that order. Present your slide. Name, Jesse. I'm Jesse Free. I teach law at the Jewish Law School in uh, Cambridge, I write on executive compensation, corporate governance, insider trading, venture capital, and starting a new uh, research line on cross-border enforcement, and that will be the subject of my paper tomorrow. Hey, uh, like the wall. Like the wall. Hmm? Like the wall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, uh -huh. okay, yeah. Um, my name is Kaylin Hawk. I, I teach in Northwestern, the University of in Chicago, and in law school also. Um, I write about corporate and securities law and processing uh, and uh, venture capital. Ronald Kelly, University of Geneva. Uh, recently moved uh, from Cornell after a few years there. I'm a professor and very interested in corporate governance and my good friend is the author, you have to present here this morning. Yes. Uh, so my name is Hans Lau, I'm from the University of uh, Mannheim. I'm an uh, economist, a financial economist, uh, working on all areas of corporate governance, ranging from executive compensation to insider trading. More recently, we did a lot of work on uh, finance and uh, labor. My name is Suman Banerjee. Hello. My name is Suman Banerjee. I'm from Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. I do behavioral finance, corporate governance, and also the borderline area of behavioral corporate governance. And in a year to present a paper on 12 class of decapitalization. I am I'm Amir Lech. I'm a law professor at the Interdisciplinary Center of Herzliya uh, here in Israel. I write on comparative corporate governance, fiduciary law, something like that. Hi, uh, Asaf Mdavi. I'm a 
corporate law professor at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I wrote about a variety of corporate law topics, uh, regulation of controlling shareholders, institutional investors, pension regulation, and so on. Berlan Lugini, Berlan University, finance. I do mostly behavioral finance. Hi, Fatshus from the Open University of Israel. I'm from the area of accounting, and I'm interested in corporate, corporate governance, especially executive compensation. Hi, I'm Eni Abudi. I'm from Barry Lang University, the department uh, with Benny, and I'm interested in corporate governance and uh, most executive compensation. Um, Western University, visiting Tel Aviv. For almost as long as Lucian has, um, and um, that's probably enough. I'm Rebecca Lisa, and a PhD student here in Berlin University, the University of Supervision of the Professor Lockerbach, and my PhD is about uh, uh, benchmarking practice and CL computation. Jacob Dudek from Tel Aviv University. I work mostly on corporate finance, but I'm also interested in corporate governance. Hi, my name is Ruthie Rus uh, from the Duke University, a PhD student, uh, mostly writing now in accounting, uh, but also interested in corporate governance. Uh, good morning. My name is Chong Man Yu. I'm currently second year postdoc in Tel Aviv University. Uh, my, I worked my PhD thesis on comparative technical regulation. I'm continuing my project on that topic. Thank you. Lucian Bebchuk, uh, Harvard, interested in corporate governance. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me that I'm old and I've been doing it for a long time. Marco Bech, I'm at the Soviet Brussels School of Economics and Management in Brussels, over the corporate governance chair that was endowed by Jonas Bruce. Dorothy Lund at the USC Gold School of Law. Uh, I write about corporate governance and institutional investors. Conrad Rapp from the Norwegian School of Economics. I work on the corporate governance. Hi, I'm Hans Ashim from Cornell University. I work on uh, governance, labor and finance, and uh, capital investment. Hi, I'm Tim Shu uh, from University of Virginia Garden School of Business. I mainly work on uh, empirical corporate governance and entrepreneurial finance. I'm Ned Rock from NYU uh, School of Law. I'm a law professor. Uh, I work on corporate governance, and these days I seem to write about black <laughs> Hi, I'm Colby Castillo from Tel Aviv University School of Law, focusing on corporate governance and controlling uh, of law. And it's time to know and now to invite our keynote speaker, Professor Lucian Webchuk, James Barr, Ames, <coughs> Professor of Law, Economics and Finance, and Director of the Program of Corporate Governance uh, at Harvard University. As we know, he has many other uh, beautiful achievements in this area and uh, many of us owe him, his, uh, owe him their, uh, their research because he started a lot, a lot of uh, topics in corporate governance and we thank him for it and, and we are honored, we are honored to have you here and we invite you to the podium. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Benny, for this uh, uh, very, very kind uh, uh, introduction. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Uh, uh, Benny has assembled uh, the globe's leading researchers on dual class structures. Hopefully, 50 years from now, people will talk about it the way they talk about the physics conferences on quantum mechanics in the 20s, <laughs> when all the great minds uh, I came to argue the subject. So um, I'll talk about um, a, a theory that uh, Kobe Castiel um, here and I put forward uh, uh, um, uh, earlier, 
and that is uh, connected to some of the work that will be uh, featured, some of the current work that will be featured in this conference. Uh, for disclosure, I should mention um, my role. Oh, I have to press this, okay. Uh, I should mention my role in uh, serving as an expert witness in the litigation over the Facebook with reclassification uh, uh, that contributed to the abandonment of the plan. Um, it's okay? Okay. All right. Uh, the plan that I'll have is I'll talk a little bit about the motivation, the history, the precursor work for uh, uh, what Kobe and I did in the paper that was ultimately published uh, uh, in 2017. We talk about the uh, uh, building blocks of our theory. Uh, I'll talk about some examples, some of them ones that we had in mind, some of them were ones that developed after uh, uh, we wrote our paper, but that I vividly illustrate the analytical points uh, we were making. And then I'll talk about uh, uh, um, the quote unquote the practical payoffs of of the theory uh, in the sense that uh, it does uh, seem uh, to have contributed to developing support for sunsets uh, uh, as well for some subsequent empirical work. Okay. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about kind of how this uh, uh, developed, about Picasso's work, uh, and also about the the journey that uh, uh, I, as well as Kobe, uh, uh, followed to, to get uh, uh, to the point and what, what motivated us. So uh, I have long uh, been concerned about the efficiency cost of separating cash flow rights and voting rights. Um, growing up in Israel, uh, the pyramids were very uh, uh, important and uh, uh, powerful. Um, in an earlier uh, paper with uh, Rainier and Triantis, we uh, uh, kind of uh, provided a fairly early analysis of the agency costs uh, uh, of separating cash flow rights and voting rights. And we made, uh, uh, and our key point was uh, uh, to show that those agency costs were not just increasing as the equity stake uh, goes down, but that they were increasing at an increasing rate uh, uh, so that you have really to worry about structures in which the equity stake of the controller is especially small, which is what happens in some dual class structures. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity uh, uh, to work on this in a practical context. Uh, and my co uh, concerns about separation of cash flow rights and voting rights were reinforced when I served as the outside expert for an Israeli governance committee. It was called the Concentration Committee, which in the beginning of this decade focused on the problem of corporate pyramids in Israel. Uh, and in my report, uh, uh, and Kobe uh, uh, at the time helped me uh, work on it, uh, my report and ultimately uh, uh, the committee's uh, final report recommended banning pyramidal structures with more than two layers, uh, which contributed to legislation that uh, was adopted with such a legislative ban uh, uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and Israel is one of the few countries that have taken such uh, strong measures uh, uh, against pyramidal structures. At the same time, uh, uh, some uh, uh, of my work has started to look at uh, uh, not just at whether those structures are costly, but how this costliness changes over time. Uh, in 2003, in a paper about IPO arrangements that provide anti-takeover pro uh, protection, I put forward the case for sunsets for anti-takeover arrangements in general. 
Uh, and the claim was, even if we adopt the view that those are optimal at the IPO stage, uh, um, there should be, we should be open, we should be thinking about having sunsets. And I picked up on this also during the, my work for the concentration committee in an interim report, uh, which was put into the interim rep recommendations of the committee, which ultimately were not adopted. I put forward some arrangements that try to deal especially with uh, pyramidal structures that were quote unquote obsolete, that have been in place for a long time, and trying to facilitate the possibility of breaking up such structures. Okay. So this brings me uh, uh, to uh, uh, the theory that uh, Kobe and I kind of fully developed and put forward in, in our work. After the completion of the pyramid project, we turned to dual class structure uh, because wanting to write for an American audience, uh, dual class structures are really the most common, the most important instrument for separating cash flow rights and voting rights. And also at the time we decided to focus on them, they were growing in practical importance because uh, uh, the, uh, the percentage of firms going public with them was increasing and also some economically very important companies like Google and Facebook had them. Now, the strategy that we have decided to focus on was the following. We personally are actually, unlike some of the people in this room uh, uh, who share our view in some dimension, uh, we are actually skeptical of the efficiency of dual class structures most of the time, even at the IPO stage. But we recognize that this is something on which individuals may reasonably disagree, and there are some plausible theoretical arguments why a dual class structure might be efficient in the years following the IPO. So what we decided to do was to try to identify, try to isolate a subset of dual class structure so that even people who are sympathetic to the view that we should allow dual class structures in the years immediately following the IPO would accept or would tend to recognize that those structures are with high likelihood uh, uh, inefficient. And we decided in two separate works to focus on two subsets. So our first work on which I will uh, focus here focused on the time dimension and the special perniciousness of long-standing dual class structures. In a subsequent uh, uh, paper uh, uh, that Kobe will present later today, we focus on the ownership uh, stake uh, uh, dimension. And because our strategy uh, uh, was one that we were trying to create a common denominator to create uh, um, a position that would get as broad a support as possible and that might be practically possible to, to get traction. Uh, we spent some time talking with the investor community, starting in a keynote uh, speech on uh, dual class structures uh, uh, that I gave at the ICGN uh, uh, event in, in 2015. Uh, uh, identifying those two subsets, uh, pernicious subsets that we thought institutional investors should uh, uh, focus on, and subsequently working with the CII. Okay, let me uh, talk about uh, uh, some examples that make vivid uh, uh, the key point that whatever you think about the IPO stage, once you get sufficiently far, from uh, uh, the IPO stage, there is an increasing risk uh, uh, that uh, um, the dual class structure will cease to be efficient. So let's take the Redstone Viacom CBS example. It's an example that we stress in our paper, and we were already stressing in the first version in 2014, 
because already then there was litigation suggesting that Sumner Redstone couldn't remember uh, uh, his name, uh, uh, the name with which he was born. And events, more recent events, have been just reinforcing how, quote unquote, beautiful this example is for our thesis. So Sumner Redstone was a great businessman, was a great business leader in the media sector in the 90s. Also, you know, by the way, great, you know, he's a uh, loyal do uh, uh, graduate of Harvard Law School, so we shouldn't say anything about his greatness at some uh, point in time. But uh, he's now 94, and there is evidence uh, uh, that uh, he uh, uh, can't talk, can't uh, speak coherently, uh, uh, and, you know, Let's not go uh, farther uh, in, in describing uh, his uh, um, unfortunate situation. Now, even when he passes away, the perils of the situation we, the shareholders, are in are not going to completely disappear because control is going to pass to a trust. And if you look at the seven trustees, most of them don't really have uh, 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 business leadership experience. So even if this structure were efficient in the early 90s, it's highly unlikely that Sumner Redstone and possibly also the trust after him are efficient controllers at present. Let's take another example of Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. As we all know, Zuckerberg started in 2004, took it public in 2012. Legendary visionary, no question about it. In, 2000, in, in 2016, when Facebook put forward a risk classification plan, the board took the position, which nobody was questioning at the time, that Zuckerberg's leadership was a key asset of the company. And in our paper, uh, we acknowledge this, but we said, this is now. By the way, things have moved faster. Already at the moment, uh, 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 there are various calls that question whether Facebook's leadership uh, uh, is most fitting for the current challenges and dealing with the crisis that are uh, uh, engulfing the company. But more importantly for our thesis, Let's suppose that Zuckerberg right now is the best person to deal with Congress and the various crises. Zuckerberg is now 34. Even if he's value enhancing now, will this remain the case when he's 54, 64, 74, 84, 50 years from now? So we think that the answer to this rhetorical question is kind of clear that public investors face substantial risk that can be expected to grow over time that Zuckerberg's leadership would cease to be efficient and could well become value destroying over time. And we discuss this more fully in uh, a forthcoming work that uh, builds on uh, the expert report that we worked on uh, with respect to the Facebook reclassification. Okay, let me now go uh, uh, to the kind of key theoretical steps that we made in putting forward our argument. Uh, so we basically were looking at both the cost and the benefits of dual class structures, which have long been are uh, discussed in the literature and are familiar to people who are interested in entrenchment in general. And we all know that entrenchment could possibly have positive and negative effect. But our key move was to say, if you look at both the cost side and the benefit side, you'll see that both of them change over, can be expected to change over time in a way that moves the balance in a certain clear direction. If you take, for example, cost, so the costs are a function of whether the controller has now good skills to be heading this company. 
And even if you have someone who was very fitting uh, at the time of going public, we have a dynamic environment and two things change. One is the controller changes. We all know from our own experience that we change all the time. <coughs> our energy, our vision, uh, uh, various other aspects. And also the needs of the company and the circumstances and the challenges it faces change. And the combination means that it's increasingly likely that the fit would no longer be a good one as time uh, uh, marches from the IPO on. Obviously, if you have the possibility of a transfer to hairs, uh, then we have the problem of the so-called quote-unquote idiot, idiot son or idiot daughter. Uh, but our key point is that even if you have, if you prevent this in the charter, uh, the lifetime, lifetime control creates a large risk uh, uh, of controller uh, that would not be fitting for this. Yahoo is a good example. Uh, um, it didn't have a dual class structure. And therefore, it was fortunate in being able to push out the visionary great founder. Massive success in the beginning, but later on, kind of clear failure. And uh, the founder was, for reasons that were widely accepted as uh, sensible, was pushed out. Second problem over time. Many dual class structures, Kobe will focus on this, enable the controller to unload cash flow rights without vote, without losing control. And controllers have an incentive to do so. We provide in the paper some evidence that indeed over time they uh, 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 decrease uh, the ownership stake. And the lower the ownership stake, then even for a given fit of the controller at the company, incentives become worse, and uh, this would be the heart of uh, Kobe's talk. What about potential benefits? The standard benefit uh, that is given, look, we have a visionary, especially talented, especially brilliant founder. We want to enable them to run the company without the destruction of the market. That is only valid if you really have such a controller. And our point is that this benefit is likely uh, uh, to recede and indeed likely to reverse uh, uh, over time. Long-termism, another argument that is often given why dual class structures are good. Uh, you want to insulate the controller, but this makes sense only if the controller is a good choice for heading the company. Insulating Sumner Redstone from market forces and for market criticism, uh, uh, we submit, is not uh, uh, beneficial. It might well be uh, counterproductive. We also uh, explain there, uh, it's also a point that in the case study we write about Facebook, uh, it's, it's developed uh, in, in detail and, and, and at length, that for the benefits of long-term leadership and retaining the benefits of a visionary uh, 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 founder, you don't really need entrenchment. Just think about. Uh, think about uh, Jeff Bezos has been leading the company for 20 years without any question, without any challenge, even though he chose not to go with the dual class structure, but with a one share, one vote, and now does not have a controlling block. Bill Gates led the company for about 20 years until he decided uh, uh, you know, because of 
what he wanted to do with the rest of his life uh, uh, to move on. But uh, investors uh, backed both of those visionary, successful uh, um, founders and uh, seemed willing to let them continue uh, uh, on and on. So as long as a founder is successful, uh, you can expect uh, them to be able to continue. Now, another kind of key analytical move of our theory was to say not only it's going, it's the likelihood of the dual class structure becoming inefficient over time is increasing, but also that we need to have a mechanism of dismantling quote unquote stale obsolete structures because we don't have a private ordering self-correcting mechanism. Some might say, look, if it becomes inefficient, the controller uh, uh, will bring it to an end, either sell the company or unify uh, 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 this, uh, the, the, the structure uh, by changing the charter. And what we show in our work is that controllers have very powerful incentives uh, not to do so within a very wide range of circumstances, even if it would be efficient to bring the structure to an end. So uh, think about a very simple, uh, about the model that we uh, use in our paper. You have a controller with a fraction alpha of the company's equity capital, gets uh, B as private benefits of control. If you sell the company or you unify, you would increase the value by delta V over the current value of V. The controller calculus would be to compare what the controller now has, which is alpha V plus the private benefit B. And if you assume that, rightly so, that the sale or the unification would bring to an end the private benefit of control, you would compare it to uh, alpha multiplied by V plus delta V, which means that the controller would be willing to, or would not go forward with an efficient transaction as long as delta V, the potential benefit, is less than the private benefits of control that they would be giving up, B, divided by alpha. And that means that the smaller is alpha, the larger is the resulting distortion. Just to get a sense of the magnitude, think about a controller with a 10% stake, company with a $1 billion value, private benefits of control of 5%, a number that is order of magnitude to what we have in the literature, 50 million. In this case, the controller would prefer to retain the dual class structure and not bring it to an end as long as the potential efficiency gains uh, are less than 500 million. So even if the slack is up to 50% in this example, the controller would prefer to give up a potential increase of 50% in value for the aggregate body of investors and not bring uh, control to an end. Let me uh, uh, skip this, as I see I'm proceeding too slowly. Um, that led us to, uh, in terms of practical recommendation, to put forward a recommendation for sunset closes. Uh, um, we were suggesting uh, uh, you know, something of the order of 10 years uh, uh, after uh, uh, the IPO. Um, uh, Benny and his co-authors, they have a number of, of seven deriving it from, from their empirical uh, findings. We are obviously working uh, uh, kind of on, on a judgment and looking for uh, around numbers. And for, for us, 10, and you were saying in the paper, 10 to 15 years seem to us as something that would, should be fully acceptable to supporters of dual class structures because it would give them the insulation for a very big, very long period after the IPO, but would uh, 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 get rid of the very long tail that creates those risks of inefficiency. And then we had this extra element that 
trying to address this problem that what happens if somehow this structure continues to be efficient? So you can extend it for fixed periods of time, let's say each time by another 10 years with a vote of approval by the public investors. Could you have, uh, 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 we discussed alternative designs of sunsets and we explain why we do not favor them. One is, and you see it, uh, we have in our paper, uh, kind of we document the types of sunsets that you have. They were a minority at the time we wrote, but some of them existed. Most of them were triggered by uh, a death or retirement. We think it goes in the right direction, but it's too little because Basically, if you look at the evidence, many of the founders are decades away from retirement, and we wish them long lives, so probably decades uh, away from death. And being stuck in a long-standing dual structure, structure for decades might well be too late. There is another, uh, um, uh, Kobe will talk about it in the paper he presented, there is another thing that Another sunset that is becoming common where it's triggered on ownership. Just to mention its connection to what I'm discussing, some people would refer to this as a remedy for the time problem, but it really isn't because if you have a 10% trigger, it would just mean that the controller would get to the 10% and stop there, but they can stay with 10% for the end of their life, which would uh, leave uh, unaddressed the problem on which we are focusing. Quickly, uh, some uh, uh, objections. I'm sure that it might come uh, uh, later on. Um, isn't the fact that some companies go public without sunset, does not that mean that it's optimal? As you all know, there is this fundamental debate in the literature. Should we accept everything that happens at the IPO as optimal? If you are a complete contractarian, uh, then you, are not really, you shouldn't really be interested in trying to understand what's efficient, because whatever the market produces is efficient. But if you are open to thinking about what's efficient and what not, uh, uh, and um, um, uh, then what our paper suggests is here is something that policymakers and investors should think about. And we hope in subsequent work to describe the argument for mandatory intervention in kind of a full developed fashion. Um, in the interest of time, let, let me skip another objection that entrepreneurs will avoid taking their companies public. We don't really think that practically for most of them that's an option. The private market would not let you stay private with absolute control forever. Right now there is private financing only because people expect that you'll go public and then they'll be able to exit and make a good return. Um, there is there is now a current work uh, 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 that suggests uh, uh, that kind of responds to our paper and says, look, we are worried that the extension option isn't really real because shareholders are just going to vote blindly against this because the guidelines uh, uh, um, are against uh, dual class structures. We don't think that's a big problem. If anything, that's connected to what I'll discuss tomorrow. We think that social investors, if anything, are excessively differential to what boards suggest. And therefore, we think that the risk that they would vote against the insiders when it's against their own interest is not, is not large. And then there are also examples of shareholders. There is a when on case in Canada where shareholders actually extended the dual class structure with the sunset, 
when there was uh, uh, good meritorious reasons for doing so. A little bit about the things that followed uh, uh, where uh, uh, we uh, uh, are pleased that our work uh, seemed to uh, contribute to subsequent development. Uh, the CII, the Council of Institutional Investors, uh, for full disclosure, uh, I worked and interacted with them on their petition. Um, and kind of rel relying on our work, they submitted a petition uh, to the stock exchange as to mandate sunsets as a condition for listing both NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, BlackRock and also an organization uh, uh, that uh, brings together both leading issuers and leading investors both expressed support for subsets uh, very recently. Uh, Commissioner Rob Jackson uh, uh, made a speech supporting sunsets. And then uh, um, lastly, I'll talk about the empirical work uh, that is actually going to be presented here. So it's uh, 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 great uh, that <coughs> be discussing it when uh, those papers are going to be presented. And we are delighted that people indeed uh, uh, tested those hypotheses that we put forward. So in our paper, we said here are our normative recommendations. But here, there are also clear, testable, we have a section on empirical predictions. And we say here are two clearly testable predictions that we hope empirical work uh, uh, will uh, investigate. The first hypothesis was that controlling for relevant characteristics, you would expect the performance, the valuations, and also agency costs to become performance and valuation to decline, agency costs to become more severe as the time from the IPO passes. And, you know, uh, uh, subsequently, there are actually four empirical investigations, some more comprehensive, some less, that tested this and then found results that are consistent with this. Uh, the paper by uh, uh, Benny and his co-authors, Kremers, Lauterbach, and uh, Fausten. Um, the paper by Kim and Michaeli, both of them uh, um, I won't describe because they are here, both of them look at performance broadly defined. There is a paper by Baran, Frost, and Via. They look just at one dimension, which is uh, uh, they focus on the innovation dimension. Again, they find something consistent with our uh, uh, hypothesis that even on this dimension that people uh, stress when, we ca when, they, when they talk about dual class structures. Um, they find a decline in performance along this dimension uh, uh, starting in the six to 10 year window out of the IPO. And uh, Commissioner Jackson uh, did, his comparison was somewhat different. He was comparing firms with and without subsets, with and without sunset as a way of testing this declining performance hypothesis. The second hypothesis thus far has been uh, 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 tested only in one uh, subsequent empirical paper, but uh, results were fully consistent. So for reasons that I already uh, put on the table for you, we were hypothesizing that controlling for relevant characteristics, companies with a dual class structure are likely to have substantial persistence, which means that they would be less likely uh, to be sold compared with other similar companies and <coughs> unlikely to have their dual class structure dismantled. In the Kremers, Lauterbach, and Fauste paper, finds results that uh, confirm uh, this hypothesis. 
Okay, uh, let me uh, uh, conclude. Uh, uh, um, and uh, um, kind of state uh, uh, or our view is that this uh, theory that we put forward uh, has uh, good plausible theoretical foundations. It didn't when we put it forward, but it now has solid empirical support, which uh, is uh, delightful. <coughs> and it seems to have uh, a growing support both from investors and policy uh, makers. And we hope that it will continue to provide a useful framework uh, for policy makers and investors, but also for researchers like the ones uh, assembled in this room. So uh, thanks, and uh, I look forward to your comments and questions. Oh, you want to do the mic? Any questions? Any questions from the audience? Questions from the audience? Okay, starting. So, so you like to come? So the question I will have is, what if the goal is not firm level efficiency? Right? What if um, I'm a controller and I say, look, I want to run my com company honestly, even if I could make more money by cheating, and I want to do it for the rest of my life, and I don't care if share value goes up or down, because that's just who I am and how I want to behave. And I want you to buy shares in my company knowing that I'm never going to give up control, and it's inefficient, and I'll get less value for my shares, sure. but I don't care, I'm rich enough anyway. Sure, sure. It's efficient in the... We'll, we'll discuss this in, uh, uh, in our work on the mandatory basis for, for intervention. But just saying briefly, one, it's efficient in the economist sense that you have someone who attaches a monetary valuation to control. And in a standard economic model, that would be uh, what you would expect to happen. Uh, but if what our choice, what our, we're trying to do is to focus from a policy perspective on what's efficient, the only question that remains is, would the controllers, let's suppose if we don't have a dual class structure, would the controller be able to cultivate this strong preference in a different way? Some people say, look, they'll just continue to be unicorns forever. They're just here, they just remain in the private sector forever. Our judgment, and we'll, we'll discuss it in, in our work, is that that's not, we discussed a little bit in the 2017 paper, that's not really an option. If you look at the unicorns that have been receiving a lot of attention, there is, there is no pool of private money that would give uh, uh, Uber money to say, you can control the company indefinitely if you stay private. They give them money because they are hoping they'll go public. And when they go public, they'll cash. So if they go public, and the only option to go public is to go public with sunsets, uh, we believe that that's what uh, likely will happen. Yes? I just want to re-ask Bernie's question, because I don't think you, you directly responded. Suppose that you have people taking Google public, and um, they decide that they want to they want to control Google for the rest of their lives because they want the ability to do moonshot projects and do all sorts of crazy things that may have negative um, net present value to investors just because that's what they want to do. And everybody understands that. And so sure. at, the, at the IPO, um, people discount the shares by 20% relative to what they would pay under the Bevtrek-Hastial sunset arrangement or something else. 
And um, these people on the margin are happy to trade off dollars for psychic pleasure. And if you, if you were to restrict that arrangement, you would actually reduce utility, no. right? No, I, I fully understand. Okay. This is basically the standard uh, contractarian argument. So there's a contractarian argument. You're making it in this example. But you can say it about anything. You can say, look, somebody goes public and says, I want to have to be able to do insider trading if somebody goes public and says, I want to be able to have target boards for seven years. Whatever happens, the market is smart. Those are dads buying shares. Jensen Meckling says it's optimal. Now, we already had this debate, and some of the people here are old enough, Bernie and I, we were there, about, uh, uh, about there are some grounds we know that legal rules do impose some mandatory constraints. Inside trading is one. Even Delaware law has various things that you cannot do. You cannot have a company uh, uh, with a staggered board for five years. You cannot have a, con a company without an annual meeting. Now, there are standard reasons in the literature, which not everybody accepts, for why you should have mandatory rules. And what we are going to explain is that those reasons have especially good force in this context. Anyone who is interested, you know, so this, describing those reasons, uh, 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 you know, there is, uh, somebody might want to look, you know, this literature goes back to the 1990 Columbia Law Review uh, Symposium. Uh, but, so there are a bunch of standard reasons, and what our, our argument will be that those reasons have, they are especially applicable to the dual class context. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm generally sympathetic to your view, um, but, but um, here, here's what troubles me. Um, I I'm, I'm trying to understand whether there is a principled um, limit to the kind of restrictions you want to impose on uh, people deciding to control enterprises, right? So I saw your example with um, a very old man and who really shouldn't be running a company, but somehow he does. Um, and, and I understand well, the issue. You can, you can run the company, but when it's 90% of the money comes from others, I have a problem with it. Okay, okay. So, you, so I, I think this is where, this is where you, you, you may need to elaborate on, on a more of a bright line, because I'm going to start saying that 90% is a real issue, is 50% a real issue? If, if you start defining the constituents more broadly than uh, equity holders, if the company has a you know, giant bunch of uh, creditors and, and other such things, and this person happens to control a majority of single class shares, but also have a very significant impact on creditors, and he is senile, um, and after that, he is transferring his shares not to this ridiculous trust, which I agree with you shouldn't be, but to his equally ridiculous son. I mean, is that also something that we should involve the government in? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grab a, a place at which he will say, this is my principal place yes. of stopping. Yes. So, yeah, my, this, is, this all goes back, and it seems that, you know, uh, if Benny will invite me to another mm -hmm. conference, I'll forget about this, but. Basically, this all goes back to the question of do you want ever to have mandatory restrictions on IPO choices? Okay. There are standard reasons in the literature where you have imperfect information, where you have uh, uh, externality. You, know, you have a standard reasons in the literature, and basically you have a trade-off as to whether those reasons are applicable here, one, and two, how confident you are how confident policymakers are, they can never be 100% sure that they've identified uh, what's a bad arrangement. Because they're not confident, they might want to be cautious. So maybe they'll say, there is a broader set that we are suspecting are problematic, but they should basically intervene just in cases like insider trading, where they think in the case of insider trading, we are not leaving it to free contracting, because in the case of insider trading, one is uh, um, you have uh, externalities, and two, uh, policymakers, whether correctly or incorrectly, think that there is a problem, at least with some 
core inside trait. <laughs> Same thing for minimal fiduciary duties. I think that's and we would is. argue that our context is similar in this respect. I think the minute you went after insider trading, you like lost half of the audience support for the, for the state, for, for the thesis. OK. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think that, so that would just go to uh, the problem with my rhetorical skills rather than the validity of the point here. Uh, I think that I sometimes use inside trading because among non-economists, that seems like, yes, if you're, this is like as good as an example of something that is clearly right. But uh, uh, whatever it is, if you think, if you think that there is any mandatory rule that you support, then the question is, would I, you probably have reasons for that, and the question is, would I convince you that those reasons, by the way, if anyone here concludes that there are really such pure contractarians that they don't want to limit anything, they might find this line of work still interesting because they would say, this line of work is important, that's another point we say in the paper, for investors, because investors should learn to appreciate and to recognize those risks, price them better, so the work uh, uh, contributes in this way. Now you can say investors are smart, they don't need any papers, they can appreciate, you know, there's another uh, move that one uh, can make. Uh, uh, and if that's the case, then we have no contribution. <laughs> and so they're so smart, they are ignorant, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I, I have to, to go on with the program. Sure. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, he, he stays here. Thank you. Thank you.